morning, everyone. Uh, today is Tuesday, February 25th, 2020. Uh, this is the Senate Transportation Finance and Policy Committee. Uh, we have two school, bill, school bus bills on the agenda and an informational uh, hearing or presentation on school bus safety. Just to give you a heads up as to how we're going to proceed, we're going to take Senator Yazinski's uh, bill uh, regarding interim inspection certificates. Then we're going to move into the informational hearing, after which we will take uh, the uh, Senator Dram's uh, bill regarding the school bus safety campaign. And I just want to bring to your attention that uh, there is a press conference uh, regarding school bus safety on the front steps of the Capitol that uh, you are all invited to attend, and I would encourage you to do that. Uh, and that's scheduled uh, for noon, so I would really like to be done by quarter to 12. So the informational hearing is probably the one that's going to take the longest. So just kind of keep that in mind in terms of your, uh, your presentation and your statements. And we should be looking uh, at uh, testimony of uh, well under five minutes apiece, or we will run out of time, okay? Uh, with that, we will begin with Senator Yazinski's uh, uh, bill, Senate file 3254. Senator Yuzinski. Thank you, Chair Newman. Uh, today I have present uh, Senate File 254, which is the school bus interim inspection certificate. I'm going to briefly summarize, and if I mess it up, uh, Scott McMahon's going to do the technical things that I messed up. But as by practice right now, our school buses in the state of Minnesota are inspected by the State Patrol on an annual basis. If in an interim a school bus is purchased, either new or used, uh, they are put as, on as an interim permit to allow them to use that bus until the next annual inspection. That has been the practice, but by statute that is not allowed. So what the bill in front of you today does is put that into law and make that the, the correct way that that will be done. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Scott McMahon to go over any more details of that bill. Uh, Senator Zinsky, before we do that, it's my understanding that you have an author's amendment. Uh, would you like to offer that at this time? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, for my name. I have the A1 amendment, and uh, that actually actually puts in to pursuant to the uh, subdivision uh, talking about the interim inspection certificate. So, uh, with that, again, I'll turn it over to Scott McMahon. If we pass uh, the A1, please. We're gonna we'll vote on the uh, the, the amendment first. This members is an author's amendment. It's the A1 amendment. Uh, which I believe is in front of you. Uh, all those in favor of the A1 amendment, please signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The motion passes. The A1 amendment is adopted. Uh, Mr. McMahon. All right, good morning, Senator. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, members of the committee, my name is Scott McMahon. I'm here, uh, I'm a uh, lobbyist with the firm of Flaherty and Hood here on behalf of the Minnesota School Bus Operators Association. Uh, we are supporting this bill. Uh, right now, uh, we, a number of school buses are purchased every year uh, in the state of Minnesota. And it becomes a uh, great challenge when we can't get those school buses back on the road. We have the vast majority of the school buses are purchased over the summer months, as you would imagine. Um, and uh, it, it's, it creates a real uh, challenge right now for the state patrol to try and inspect each one of these buses individually uh, as they come off of the lot and try and get into the fleet. And so what this bill does is it simply puts into practice what had been, uh, or puts into statute what has been practiced from October of 2019 prior for probably a decades prior to that, um, <coughs> that was determined back in November, uh, wasn't supported by state statute. So this just simply puts in state statute what the practice has been. Uh, there have been no perceived issues with new buses coming in into uh, the fleets as having issues. Uh, and so we don't see any, uh, any safety concern about this process being put into statute and moving forward. Uh, we do have at the testifying table the State Patrol. Uh, if you would uh, identify yourself, Lieutenant, uh, and uh, give us the patrol's perspective on the bill. All right, thank you, Chair. Lieutenant Brian Rue with the State Patrol, uh, specifically oversee the Office of Pupil Transportation. Uh, so, Chair and members, 
we have a staff of 15 civilian employees that do these annual school bus inspections around the state on a yearly basis. Um, as Senator Jasinski stated, um, this is a practice that was in place upon finding out that it wasn't supported statutorily. Um, we took on uh, doing these first time initial inspections back in November. Um, right now it's, you know, it's still a struggle to get to these places in a timely fashion. Uh, we work with the contractors of the districts and the dealerships as best we can to get there so they can get these buses in the fleets and on the road. Um, as Mr. McMahon stated that uh, June, July, and August, we see a, a, a lot of influx in new and used buses coming into the state, uh, which will make it even more challenging for us to have to get there, um, especially when you're thinking, you know, we got, in addition to just the school buses, we look at any vehicle that's used to transport wheelchair-bound passengers. So we got about 23,000 vehicles a year we look at. Um, and, you know, if we can go to War Road and do all their buses at once, that's fine. We can be strategic and use our time wisely. But now we got to potentially drive up there for one additional bus, um, which takes a whole day for some of our inspectors to get up there and back uh, just based on the geography of the areas we have to travel. So um, we certainly appreciate the... Um, School Bus Association and operators bringing this bill forward. Thank you, Lieutenant. Uh, any questions from any members? Senator Sengel. Uh Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a curiosity question, maybe to uh, Lieutenant uh, or, or otherwise. Uh, what are the two or three most uh, uh, often recognized deficiencies when you do an inspection? Lieutenant? Thank you, Chair and Senator and, and members. Uh, one of the biggest things that we'll see is just equi um, uh, emergency exit related issues. Uh, they're required to have a buzzer that goes off when the windows are open or the rear door is open just so if a kid's fiddling around with it that, that one, they're alerted that, hey, the door or the window could pop open. Um, and then the driver's aware that, hey, somebody's screwing around back there with something like that. That would be one of the biggest things that would put a bus out of service. I mean, we'll see other minor issues with um, lights, uh, you know, like a clearance light not working. Obviously, if it's a school bus eight-way warning light, that's a critical issue. But um, it does vary. Uh, but the major ones that are putting out buses out of service are your emergency exit-related issues, uh, brake issues, um, and then your critical lights. Thank you. Senator Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And this is uh, really a question for uh, council. When we talk about the uh, inspection certificate in subdivision two, uh, we say no person shall drive, no owner shall knowingly permit, da, da, da. But then on subdivision four, we talk about a person who operates a school bus. Is that the same person? Uh, or is this the driver that would be guilty of the misdemeanor? Ms. Stingle. Senator Carlson, and as we speak, she is looking up the answer for you. So just one moment. Good, thank you. While Ms. Stengel is uh, looking up the answer, are there any other questions? Seeing none, we'll just take a minute. Chair, if I may respond to that question. Lieutenant. Um, so the, the enforcement side of it, the citation would be issued to the, the driver who operates it. Um, with that, if the carrier knowingly allows it to go out, there is the clause under 169.90, um, I believe it is, where owner operator allowing illegal operation. So the owner could also be charged if they knowingly allowed um, the operation of it. Senator Carlson, does that answer your question? Primarily, yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Any further questions? Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, to the state trooper, you mentioned that uh, you have a hard time trying to get to all of the different locations for, for t um, checking out, inspecting, and so forth and so on. What would make it, I'm sure, you know, more people, but I'm just wondering how many more if you, if you were to do a, a job that could be squashed to a you know a smaller time frame than rather the larger 
Lieutenant. <clears throat> Chair, Senator, members. Um, I'm not here to ask for more bodies today. Um, with the the way it currently is, we deviate or we uh, disseminate the inspection based on the carriers know which month they're going to be inspected in primarily, and we'll go do their entire fleet um, in that month. Or if it's a larger fleet, like some of the ones in the metro or greater area, uh, larger areas where they have multiple hundreds of buses, we may split those up over a few months. Um, but we strategically. Um, coordinate those inspections, we can be there in a timely fashion and get them all in one day. Where the struggle is with this, what this bill is to address is, okay, we might have to be in St. Cloud and do a bunch of buses, but now we also got to get all the way out to Traverse County for one bus that they're getting. Um, you know, if we could do a batch group at the dealership, it would help a little bit, but yet there's certain aspects that the carriers put on their vehicles once they take delivery, so they're really not truly ready until that point. So we couldn't just look at it at the dealership, um, a bunch of them at once, and then send them out. So we would have to go to several different locations for one bus, and that just adds that added drive time. Senator Zinsky, did you have a response? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to clarify for Senator Anderson well. Again, they, these are done on an annual inspection for the fleet that they have. It's when they buy a new vehicle that's in between that period. They need to get a onesie or a twosie or maybe three buses that they've bought in after that inspection. This gets them into service right away, uh, <laughs> temporarily or interim with the interim pass, and then they meet their next inspection as it comes to the next scheduled date. So they do them across the state in a schedule Why They you know strategically go across the state to get them done on an annual basis. This is just the ones or twos that get purchased in between those annual inspections. Mr. Chair, Senator, uh, Senator Jasinski, but it's still, from what I'm hearing the troopers say, it's going to me mean a concentrated setting priorities as to how to get to each one and be with all the, the requiredness uh, requirements uh, that we're going to put on them. Uh, and I'm just wondering, that's why I'm asking the question about would an extra person or individual need be needed? Chair and Senator Anderson yeah. and members, uh, this is alleviating that extra requirement. Currently, there's no authority for the dealers to do that. So we've had to take that on. It was a practice we were doing. The dealers had been doing it. And when we found out that they couldn't be, obviously, we, we ceased that um, operation and we took it on. And this will help alleviate that added burden that we've had. Misunderstood. Uh, we have, uh, or it's been pointed out to me by uh, Senate Council uh, that we've got a small correction that we have to make to the uh, uh, amendment that was adopted. Uh, I'm going to have Ms. Stengel explain it, and then uh, Senator Izinski, you can make the appropriate motion. Ms. Stengel. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, as you'll notice, all the other sections in the bill have an immediate effective date, but the Section 3 in the A1 amendment that was adopted does not. Um, so to fix that, the amendment would be um, on the A1 amendment, page one after line seven, insert effective date. This section is effective the day following final enactment. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would uh, so move the uh, oral amendment as by staff. Any questions by members? Seeing none, all those in favor of the oral amendment uh, offered by Senator Jasinski, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The oral amendment is adopted. Um, at this point, uh, Senator Yazinski, if you would uh, want to move your bill as amended, I believe it has to go to the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would uh, move for, to approve Senate File 50, 3254 as amended and placed on general orders. All those in favor of Senator Yazinski's uh, motion, please signify by saying aye. Those opposed, no. The motion passes, and the bill is placed on general orders. Thank you, Lieutenant. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. Thank you, Senator Yuzinski. Mr. McMahon, you can stay. Uh, we're, we're coming to you. Uh, members, we're now going to take up the uh, informational presentation on school bus safety. Uh, and uh, uh, I have... Uh, There's nine folks that are listed to testify. I'm going to call the, the first three up uh, to the testifying table. And members, uh, uh, we'll welcome your questions, but let's wait until uh, we get through the presentation. 
Uh, Mr. McMahon is at the table. Mr. Hicks, if you would come up, and Mr. Meyer, if you would come up, and uh, we will begin. Mr. McMahon. Great. Thank you, Senator and uh, members of the committee. Uh, once again, my name is Scott McMahon. I'm with Flaherty and Hood here on behalf of the Minnesota, Minnesota School Bus Operators Association. Um, <coughs> what we have today is just a, a quick overview of what we see on a daily basis on the roads of Minnesota. Uh, we see far too often that a bus, drive, bus driver stops the bus, extends the stop arm, and the drivers around them decide that it's more important for them to keep going where they're going rather than stopping and obeying the law. So we just want to give you a sense as to what we're experiencing, give you, give you some visuals as to what it is, um, and let you kind of hear from the operators and the drivers uh, what they're seeing and frankly just how dangerous this is for our thousands of kids across the state of Minnesota. <clears throat> a quick overview of the Minnesota School Bus Operators Association. We are the association of the private contractors who contract with school districts. Uh, all of our businesses are locally owned, uh, members of the communities that they serve. Uh, all of our members, for the most part, live where they work and where their buses operate. Uh, we represent about 60% of the bus routes in the state of Minnesota uh, through about 130 independent operators. Uh, the realities of stop arm violations in the state of Minnesota. Every year in April, uh, Lieutenant Rue and his crew at the State Patrol uh, do a one-day survey where they ask all the school bus drivers in the state of Minnesota to report in how many bus stop or stop arm violations they encountered on that day. For the past number of years, we have been around 650 being reported on that day. You take that out over 170 school days, and you're up over 100,000 of these happening every day. And that's with maybe a quarter to a third of the bus drivers responding. So in reality, we're probably somewhere between 100,000 and a quarter million of these happening every school year across the state of Minnesota. And you'll see from the videos that we have that some of them look very simple and basic. It's just, it's just a car driving past a stop school bus. The reality is every time a school bus stops, there's a child either getting off or getting on that bus. The outside of the school bus, frankly, is the most dangerous place that the kid is going to encounter because it's the place where we have the least control over the environment that they're in. Uh, um, one of the challenges that we have with, with stop arm violations is the enforcement is very hard. We are very fortunate in Minnesota where we have rules and statutes that allow a bus driver when they see a stop arm violation occur and they capture that bus driver's license plate and they get information about the vehicle that they can call it into their dispatch, they can report it to the local authorities and the local authorities have the ability to issue a, citi a citation to the owner of that vehicle. The challenge that we face is as good of an effort as our bus drivers play, it's really hard to A, get a license plate and B, make sure that every kid is safe in that, in that environment. And frankly, I would rather have our drivers paying more attention to the kids who are on the buses and making sure that they're, that they're safe, rather than focusing and trying to get a you know, six-digit license plate number and get that reported in. Thankfully, we do have very dedicated bus drivers on both the private side and the school district side that do a great job of, of keeping the kids safe and getting that information and reporting to the local authorities. The challenge that we face is that even when we report it in, very rarely do we actually have a citation issued to the owner of the vehicle, and then very rarely once that citation is issued do we have the, court, have the courts upholding that citation. If you think about other driving offenses, we have, you know, if you're uh, cited for drunk driving, if you're cited for speeding, if you're cited for all these different things, those citations hold, and they wander through the court system, and the judge and the police officers and the judges say, you know, you're guilty of this crime, you're gonna pay this, pay this fee. You're gonna hear from our operators today that we have varying practices across the state of Minnesota as to how that process actually goes through. And so, frankly, our ability to cite drivers for passing a stop school bus isn't a deterrent for them because we're not enforcing the process. Um, the other challenge we have is, is a stop arm violation is a very finite experience. It happens in a 50-foot span on a road. Drunk driving, speeding, talking to your cell phone, those happen over miles. And so the likelihood of the police officer or the state trooper seeing that crime happen is much more likely versus them being in the exact spot where, where this crime happened. So it is helpful that we do have the ability for the operators and, and the school bus drivers to report it in. We'd like to see that uh, carry through a little bit more frequently. Um, so to give you a sense as to what we're encountering, I just want to share a couple of videos with you uh, to give you a sense so you understand what it is that this is. So this is going to be your typical stop arm violation. 
point, the bus has stopped. The door is open. The stop arm is extended. You can see the, the front gate has come out. And you're getting the, the three cars coming out, coming from the front end. That first driver at this point has gone right past the, the school bus. Um, and you can hear the bus driver is calling at this point. So this is a situation where he's trying to the information. He was able to report it into dispatch. The dispatch was able to notify the local authorities. This is what we don't like seeing the stop arm violation happen. But these are the things we like to have happen where we can get that information reported in. Um, and, and now I have violated what Sam told me to do beforehand and have now lost all of my videos here. Go ahead, go help him, Sam. Brand new building, wonderful technology. Unfortunately, your testifiers don't know what we're doing up here. So millennials are the rest. <laughs> All right. So the second video will demonstrate that that these violations happen on every road across across the state. They happen on city streets, county roads, highways. Uh, it's, it's, the offenses are happening all over the place. CNV 245 red truck. CNV 245 red truck. So again, they were able to call in the license plate there um, and get that get that reported in. So our third video here is going to be out in, on a country highway. Um, and this is we're going to trying to show you just how fast some of these drivers are coming by here. Um, you'll notice uh, here in a moment that a driver, that the bus stops, the stop arm comes out, um, and the driver moves by uh, the vehicle at a very fast clip. Um, if you think about the notion of a eight-year-old child somewhere in the vicinity of this vehicle, this is an extremely dangerous situation for, uh, for that child to be facing. And from that, um, I do want to highlight that uh, we're fortunate in Minnesota. We have, as I mentioned, 100,000 of these or more happening every year across our state. And we have not had a fatality in recent years. Um, if you wander 200 miles to our east two weeks ago, um, the, the Kranz family in Plainfield, Wisconsin, was not so lucky. Two weeks ago this past Monday, uh, the family got up, had their breakfast, took their two daughters out to go to get on the school bus. Um, the four-year-old daughter and a six-year-old daughter, Mariana. That morning, a driver in a pickup truck decided that it was in his best interest to pass the school bus on the right-hand side. The six-year-old daughter was killed. The four-year-old daughter was injured. I think one of the reasons we're fortunate in Minnesota is we have a phenomenal crew of bus drivers who work exceptionally hard to make sure our kids are all safe. But the reality is, with 100,000 of these happening every, every school year, it's simply gambling with our kids' lives. At some point, we're going to come up with snake eyes, and we're going to have a tragic situation. And you'll hear later on this morning from Edina and, and a situation in which we almost had to happen back in January. Um, we do have solutions to this problem. Um, we have better technology that's out there that can help us both keep the kids safe as well as help out with the enforcement side of things. We do have better education. We can do things to help our citizens understand that they're going to stop for school buses. Um, and we can do a better job with enforcement. And all these things play together. Uh, there's no one thing that we can do that's going to solve this problem. But all these things playing together will move us forward in, in solving this problem. Um, my fourth video I want to show you is just to give you an example of how, uh, of how the enforcement actually does come to In this situation, I'd ask you to pay attention to uh, the left-hand side after this bus stops. Um, this has been a notorious intersection for this particular operator, and so they have been working with the local police department to pay attention to this specific uh, intersection. As you will see in a moment here, a car will come off of the, uh, of the cross street and turn into the bus. Um, 
you can violate the stop bar, uh, and they will shortly be followed then by a police officer following up behind them, pulling them over and citing them for the wood by so These are the things, we have strong partnerships with a lot of our local enforcement, where the operators are identifying uh, frequent violation areas, uh, bad routes, and we do have a situation that's the reality is, we have too many of these happening, and it's over too big of an area in the state to, to deal with it. So, um, you know, this is an example of something that we can um, <coughs> At this point, um, I will turn things over to, um, to Lyle Hicks and, and Paul Meyer to talk a little bit about their experience in Hutchinson and Litchfield. Um, but I, I want to share uh, quickly um, an example from them where they're using technology and this partnership to make things play. Uh, this is a video of, uh, of a recent stop arm violation in their communities where they've had stop arm cameras on the buses. Um, they've been able to capture the, uh, the evidence that the authorities need to do the prosecution. Um, this is a situation where uh, the, as you can see from the video, the first car stops, the second car stops, the third car goes around those vehicles, proceeds through the stop arm, um, and, uh, and was able to get sighted because they had the technology there and the evidence there. Um, the interesting thing is that pickup truck you just saw also got sighted because they came too far into the field before they, uh, before they decided to stop. Um, and so we have a, a second video here from the rear of the vehicle uh, showing that, that third car um, as they pass through, uh, pass through the bus. So at this point, the bus has stopped. That pickup truck will be stopping right by the, by the stop arm here shortly. Uh, that third vehicle you'll see will come through on the, on the turn lane in the shoulder area there. So that gives you a sense as to what we're facing every day out on the road. Um, and at this point, I will turn it over to Lyle and Paul to kind of give you a sense from the operators and the, the driver's perspective as to what it is that they're, that they're experiencing, how they're handling things. Thank you, Mr. McMahon. Uh, Mr. Hicks, welcome to the committee. Please state your full name uh, and uh, your interest in this matter and proceed with your testimony. Chairman Newman, uh, members, uh, my name is Lyle Hicks. I'm a school bus contractor in Litchfield, Minnesota, which is about an hour west of the Twin Cities. Um, I'm here with kind of some good news, bad news. Um, the one thing I want to do is give a shameless shout out to all the school bus drivers who do just an unbelievable job every day. Uh, we have, depending on whose numbers you want to use, between one, 100 and 200,000 stop arm violations every day. And you rarely, if ever, hear of a student being struck. Uh, that's because of the training and the dedication and the good work of those school bus drivers in keeping the kids on the bus on the shoulder, um, on the sidewalk, away from uh, accidents. I can assure you that if, if that weren't the case and kids were getting hit regularly, that uh, this conversation would have taken place a long time ago. I want to thank you for having us. Uh, the good news for us is that in Meeker County, the city of Litchfield in Meeker County, the prosecutors are really tough on stop arm violations. We have video cameras in our buses, we have forward facing and we have what are called stop arm cameras. It's a special camera that's mounted under the stop sign on the left side that, that will get uh, license plates, we're told, up to 70 miles per hour uh, as they go by. Um, our prosecutors charge these tickets and our judge in Meeker County uh, is really tough on them. Uh, they don't let them go. That's not the case, I'm told, in every uh, district court um, in the state of Minnesota. And unfortunately, I think a lot of people walk away. I don't know that enforcement stops a lot of them. I hope it does. I hope there's a deterrent there. But uh, we have people who have been stopped for these violations who are indignant that they were charged with stop going through that stop sign because there wasn't a kid in front of them or crossing in front of the bus when they happened to go through it. 
So I think there's kind of a laissez-faire attitude about it. Um, things are increasing. We had in 2017-18, we had seven. Last year we had eight violations and already this year we've had nine. Um, two of those violations this year were on one of the buses that you happen to view. Um, the first one was early in the year. The, a number of school bus contractors, or a couple I guess, had determined that uh, it was not against the law and with uh, Lieutenant Rue's blessing we were able, we uh, installed additional strobe lights that are just above the bumper in the front and the rear that come on when the red lights uh, come on. Um, these are really bright strobe lights that are eye level and we had on our bus number 14 that you saw, uh, we recently had a car drive through those and I will tell you, you cannot miss those lights. So these people are intentionally driving through uh, the stop arms and, and endangering all these kids. Um, I understand that we're here for some money for a public campaign. Um, that would be awesome. Um, even more would be better. Uh, good training at the uh, uh, student level would be really good. I've talked to the student driver trainers in Litchfield and uh, they give school bus, the school bus issue a kind of short time. So I think we have to really emphasize it. And once again, I just want to thank you all for your interest in this. Thank you, Mr. Hicks. Uh, Mr. Meyer, welcome to the committee. Please state your name and, and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for letting me speak today. Um, we had the, we have a similar system installed in all our buses as they do in Litchfield in Hutchinson, Minnesota, and I think it's it's helped immensely in the law enforcement end in prosecuting and charging these people. It used to be we had a, a form that we filled out from Sergeant Paul Davis that we got. Um, and it was pretty much he said, she said, when you brought it into the police station. Now with the videos that you saw there, very much the exact same thing. We bring them in on a flash drive, bring it to the police station, the detective looks at it, says, boy, this is gonna be a slam dunk. It, it's hard to say, no, I didn't do it. We have about two a month in Hutchinson and the outlying, in the city proper and the outlying areas. And I just got from the, the police department uh, results from just this year, we've had six of them that went to court that they denied being there at that time. The minute they see that, oh, there's video, plead guilty, plead guilty, plead guilty. Five out of the six that went to court automatically pled guilty the minute they found out there was video of them going through the stop arm. So it, in, in an enforcement area, it really helps with, with prosecuting these and issuing the tickets. And I think with the passing of the um, hands-free bill, it's gonna help that much more. There's that much less distraction, eventually, as they get used to not using their phone and driving with the phone. So thank you for your time today. Thank you, Mr. Meyer. Um, I'm gonna have uh, Jay Burnick, Rain Burnick, Scott Kennedy, and Jim uh, Perotti I think I'm saying that right. Come to the testifying table, please. And maybe uh, one of the pages could get another uh, chair up there for us. Uh, Mr. McMahon. Senator, can I ask that we keep the Kennedys off and bring Scott Putsky up before them? I'm sorry? Can I ask that we keep the Kennedy, the Kennedy conversation off of this panel and bring uh, Michael Putsky up and then close with Scott Kennedy and his bus driver? Yes. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> with your with your suggestion, that's fine with me. Uh, who wants to go first? Okay, Th uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, please state your full name, uh, where you are located. I understand you're all uh, operators. Where are you located? And then proceed with your testimony, please. Good morning. Thank you, Senator. And you uh, got to pull that mic right in close so so that we can hear you. Is that better? Louder. Good morning. There you go. <laughs> My name is Ramey Burnick, and I am co-owner of Stalky Bus Service out in Delano, which is about a half hour from here. Um, I'm here to give a, a slightly different testimony. Uh, you will not see um, any videos from out in Delano. Um, a brief history, um, Stalky Bus has been in business for over 70 years, um, which is an older company, uh, but we have only owned for five. 
So we do not have the funds and financial ability um, for 58 more payments to pay off the business um, for stop arm cameras. So um, what happens when a stop arm, like you see the video, you get the license plate. When you don't have that video, the driver has to get the vehicle make, model, color, description of the driver, if there was any passengers, and their license plate number. They're not just stopped there waiting for you to write all that down while they're going through your stop arm. So it is um, very difficult to prosecute. Um, it's very difficult to get all the information needed. And um, we just, um, so it just doesn't happen. Um, I was talking with a coworker this morning. They had five stop arms yesterday and they weren't able to get one license plate. So there's nothing you can do with that. So we are just asking for some more education and hopefully in the future, some money to help with some stop arm cameras. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, then Mr. Burnick, if you want to uh, hi, hi, uh, state Mr. your full name and, and uh, uh, how you're associated with this, then proceed. Hello, Senator. Um, thank you for inviting us down and uh, giving us the opportunity. Uh, my name is Jay Burnick. I am uh, the other owner of Stalky Bus out in Delano. We're about 35 miles west of here. Um, I guess, and then I was going to kind of go further with uh, the prosecution. And basically, if for us, it, we've been told by our local law enforcement, if we don't have the license plate and description, essentially not to bother. Um, because they're going to spend too much time and not really get anywhere with it. So in turn, a lot of our stop arm violations go un, unnoticed and unreported. Uh, and with that, a lot of our drivers, we might not even know about it as administration because they're not even saying anything if they don't have the information that we've stated to them that they need to have. So again, kind of pushing back to the technology piece and uh, hopefully then trying to um, allow for some more enforcement that way. Thank you, Mr. Burnick. Uh, next testifier, I, I, uh, I'm kind of guessing it's Mr. Putzke. If you would uh, uh, stage Mr. McMahon. And Senator, before uh, Michael provides his testimony, I do want to share the video from, uh, from his story. And before I show this video and our last video, I, I want to highlight that the next two are hard to watch. Um, these are the extremely dangerous videos that we have. Um, these are not uh, the common video that we have, but they're not the uncommon story. Um, but I do want to preface with both of the next two videos we have that nobody was injured. So be thankful for that one. Um, Please so proceed, Mr. McMahon. So I ask that as, if, as this video goes through, just pay attention to the right-hand side, the right shoulder side of this video. Um, keep in mind that that's the side that the school bus door opens on. And you can see as he pulls up here that the passenger that they're picking up is in her driveway waiting to get on the bus. Mr. Putzke, state your full name, please, uh, where you're from, and proceed. Hello, I'm Michael Putzke. I'm from Painesville Motor and Transfer Company. I'm a school bus contractor there. Um, that video, I've seen that video many, many times uh, since that happened, um, what, five, almost six years ago now. And every time I see it, there are gasps in the room because it is shocking to watch. Um, and so with that video, um, that one made, <clears throat> excuse me, that one got a lot of press and got a lot of attention because it was so horrific, so surprising that a semi would do that. Um, but there's videos where we see cars going through that can kill a student just the same. Um, it doesn't have to be a semi, um, but certainly that one was just, uh, just over the top uh, shocking to see. Um, and that bus driver, when, when he came in, he, he told me that he thought for sure that when the dust settled, 
he would see a dead little girl pulverized by an 18-wheeler. And that, uh, to his great relief, she stood there dazed but unharmed. Um, and that little girl graduated last year, um, which is fantastic. Uh, it's surprising after seeing that, that she was even with us. Um, and every year that we did bus safety training, um, I would go and talk to all the students and, and when I would go over the rules, I would catch, catch her face as I'm, as I'm talking to all of them and it would just kind of catch me and kind of take my breath for a second and remind me to double down on telling the kids, you need to listen to these rules. It is so important that you follow these rules. And it's because she was listening to those rules and waiting far enough and all those things that we had talked about, um, and, you know, like Lyle was saying with the student safety, um, all that training, um, that she was far enough back to do that. Um, so all of that training um, ahead of time is very important for the, for the kids as well. Um, and then with that one, it was tough to get information. So that was back, you know, five, six years ago, and we didn't have HD quality video. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of grainy. It's not that great to see. Um, and when I called, it was turned into the state patrol, and the officer that was assigned to it came. And a couple people had called him, um, you know, in the meantime that had seen it. Um, one of the people, actually, that he that he talked to, that person called me three hours later, and he said he was at work, and that he just couldn't work because he couldn't shake what he had seen earlier that day. Um, and he went over again with the stuff that he had seen, and he actually went, he was behind the bus. He also got passed on the right-hand side. He followed the semi and tried to catch up to him to get information, but he was so shaken that he didn't even get the right information even though he was right alongside of him. And so for bus drivers to try to catch all that information and get the details and the license plate, it's really hard to do, and we do have something that's way more important, which is you know making sure the safety of the students. Um, and so with all that information, that, that patrol officer couldn't get any good info. The, the license plate number wasn't right, or it was jumbled, or it was an ID from a trailer. Um, and so he came, and he said, well, really, uh, there's, I can't really do anything about it. Sorry. And he left. And thankfully, through our association, I've gotten, <clears throat> gotten to know a lot of the state patrol guys um, through, through that and was able to call and talk to Sergeant, um, Sergeant Paul Davis and tell him about it, which within hours, it had, it, they, had, they had taken um, you know, and put it on social media and, and had really done a lot with it. Um, but it was a matter of me knowing the right person to talk to that would cared enough about it. Um, and then back then, student cameras, we didn't have really very many cameras because back then the discussion was, well, are, are kids behaving? Do you have cameras? No, our student behavior is okay. Well, that discussion has changed to, do you have stop arm violations? Because you need cameras. Um, so it's, it's changed you know, what we see the use of the camera for. Um, yes, it's student behavior, but now also we're worried about this other level um, of outside the bus. And so um, getting having this having these videos to be able to show, um, to get that prosecution um, is really important. But even though there are videos with some other, um, other folks that, that you see videos with, even with that like silver platter handed to them, um, it's not always followed through with, uh, for the penalties, which this driver uh, got a pretty harsh penalty of 245 days in jail and a thousand dollar fine, which um, different um, officers that I talked to thought that that was really surprising that he got that much. Um, and that's usually just more of a slap on the wrist um, in his opinion. So um, that being said, I thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Mr. McMahon, do you wanna to go to uh, Mr. White at this point or? Um, we can go to Mr. Uh, Mr. Kennedy and Mr. Prati. <coughs> if if uh, Mr. Prati and Mr. Kennedy would come forward and did you have another video you we, wanted to we show? We have us? our last video. Um, okay. And this is one that many of you have probably seen. This was from last January. Uh, and then it was, uh, the video was released um, back in May. Um, on this one, you'll see the bus is coming to a stop. Uh, the family, the girl on the bus is off on the left-hand side, so she's crossing the road. You'll see way down the lane, uh, you have a car coming. Um, this bus has been stopped for a considerable amount of time. The lights are going, the stop arm is out. Uh, the car had plenty of notice uh, and, and time to pay attention to what was going on. Um, I had the chance to meet this young woman last May. 
uh, down at Scott Kennedy's shop, um, and she is, uh, she is a marvelous young woman. Um, the family is amazing. She is alive, and I, every time I watch that video, I am thankful that she is. And I, beyond an act of God, I do not know how she is still with us. Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, my name is Scott Kennedy. I'm owner of Kennedy Transportation down in Zimbrota Mazeppa, southeast Minnesota. Um, this morning, uh, <clears throat> second. Jim called me on the radio and he said uh, he had a stop for him violation. I said, okay, I will check it out when I get back to the office. I'll pull the hard drive and, and look at it. I got back there and <clears throat> Jim couldn't talk. I don't blame him. I went and pulled his video, and I couldn't talk. <laughs> this is what I saw. Um, pulled my phone out to try and dial Wapasha County Sheriff's Department. I couldn't dial. I was shaking so bad. And this is what we see. We can do better. We've done everything at Kennedy Transportation, we train the drivers. We've moved our routes so that kids don't have to cross. Sometimes they have to. Um, we've changed our routes. We've educated the kids. We've went to driver's ed classes, and I went and talked to them. I mean, no different than any other contractor in this state. We all do a great job of doing what we can. But this is out of our hands. We need, we need more help. I don't want to have to go to a parent and say that their child didn't make it. I think one thing to add, um, just as, as we deal with this story, um, Mr. Putsky commented about that his driver got the book thrown at him. This driver got a slap on the wrist, and in, in all honesty, for what they were able to identify, they found the driver. He openly admitted uh, to the police that afternoon that he was the driver that went through that situation. Um, and, you know, Scott can share with you what his actual end of the day fines were on that. So he got a $300 um, fine plus court fees, so roughly $450. 100 hours of community service, and that community service has to be done in front of um, schools, um, driver's ed, 55 alive classes, whatever it is, and uh, two hour, or two years of probation. His careless driving was dropped. And that's all that he got out of it. And, and the initial citation by Mr. statute is a, is a $500 fine, and he only got a $300 fine out of it. Mr. Perotti. Jim Perotti from Sombrota Mazeppa, school bus driver for Kennedy Transportation. Thank you, Senator Newman and staff, for letting me be here to talk today. Uh, this day did change my life. It changed a lot of people's lives that day. When you look at the video, it was probably 15 to 20 seconds of that car coming. He was doing about 30 miles per hour when he went through. You've seen the kid on the road. She had a brother that was still in the driveway, so he went between the two of them. So like I said, when it got done, I didn't know if we had one dead, two dead. Excuse me. Um, it's nonstop. This morning, car went through again. The car that went through this morning went through in October. But, as you say, if you don't have the license plate number all the way, <coughs> full description of the car, or all of that, they don't get the ticket. In October, we didn't have the last three license plate numbers. This morning, I, the lights were not red. I seen it coming and I just let it go. <coughs> but the person was, when well, they went by, talking on their t cell phone just like this. But we got the license plate numbers, like I said, had Scott check it this morning and had him pull the file. 
First three numbers matched right up, same color car, everything. This year I've had four to five people go through the stop arm. I drive rural roads. If I meet 10 cars in the morning out there, that's a busy morning. It's happening all over. The problem we also get is drivers are up to the point of since enforcement's not happening, why are we going through the effort of trying to get the license plates numbers if it's not good enough for the people they're enforcing? Like I said, the person that went through on this video was a kid that I hauled on the school bus at one time. One of the kids this fall that went through mine He's a 16-year-old going to college. I hauled him on the school bus, on shuttle. I had a chance to talk to that kid. What happened? I didn't see no school bus. It wasn't there. But no one, they couldn't figure out if he had his phone out or not that day. This is all across the state. Like you said, we've been lucky, no one's been dead. I've been driving for 39 years. Started right after high school. 93. Same route. 1993. Car stopped here. At the door. I had the first grader like this. And the driver looked at me like it was my fault. I said, you might as well keep on going. You killed the kid now. It don't matter. You know, that's what we're putting up with. we got to try something. I've been on, we did the media, media campaign last May. It worked somewhat. It was nice to see, and it's not nice to see, but at least on the comment section when the person died, the kid died in... Wisconsin on the Facebook page, the number two comment was they at least had the media campaign pasted on it for people to see. So there is media getting out there, but we need more media. We have it like one time a year and we're not seeing it the rest of the year. It's like a forgotten problem. And we've got to have it year long. We're out there year around nine months hauling kids and the people got to realize we're out there and see it. These are our neighbors, these are our friends, these are our friends' children. Most of what we're seeing is not the people from far away, it is someone living real close to you that's doing it. And somehow or another, we gotta try to get in the stop before here in Minnesota, we do lose someone. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Perotti. We have one final uh, witness uh, that would like to speak, Mr. White. Thank you for coming, Mr. White. Uh, I would ask uh, that you keep in mind it's now 1130, uh, and we do have a bill to go to so that we can get to our press conference. Uh, but uh, I do appreciate the fact that you are here. Please identify yourself with whom you are associated and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Uh, my name is David White, and I am in my 35th year as Director of Transportation for Edina Public Schools. I'm also President of the Safety Committee for the Minnesota Association for Pupil Transportation. Mr. Chair and members of the community, I would like to thank Senator Drams for introducing his bill that would appropriate $50,000 to the Department of Public Safety for this type of stop arm campaign. You know, we rely on the belief and I do, I try, that the motoring public knows what to do around a school bus. But as we've seen with these videos this morning, they don't. And I'm proven wrong on a daily basis with that. Um, about one month ago, my nightmare, or probably my worst nightmare as a transportation director came true when I received a call from my dispatcher saying that a student was just struck by a car boarding the school bus on France Avenue. I'm sure you all hopefully saw the media coverage of that. Um, I wish I could show the video right now, but I can't. Um, it was a hit and run accident. It is still being investigated as they have not found the person that was driving the motor vehicle. 
So I'll try real quickly to pretend I'm the video and give you the story real quick. Um, I have watched the video many times over. Um, it's very hard to watch. Uh, Lieutenant Rue has also seen the video. I think and can concur with that. Um, school bus is stopped on France Avenue. Traffic in each, uh, one lane in each direction. School bus stop arm is extended. Lights are flashing. This was three high school students that were stopped at, or at the corner waiting for, uh, to board the school bus. I'd say bus stops, everything's correct. First student gets on the bus. The second student is just at the doorway about to get on the bus. And the, the camera that we have facing down the steps, you see the third student about to get on the bus. And almost like a magic trick, boom, she's gone. A car passes our school bus on the right-hand side, hits her, we estimate at about 35 to 40 miles an hour, and like I say, with a blink in an eye of that camera, she's gone. You go to the forward-facing camera, you see now that she's riding on the hood of the car for approximately about 45 feet, and the car kind of makes a little jerk to the left, and she slides off the hood of the car into the snowbank. Now, as you can imagine, um, I thought she was seriously injured. Luckily, as we found out, um, her injuries were minor in the end. I don't know how. Um, if you line 10 people up and hit them with a car going 45 miles an hour, 35, I just don't know how. But thank God she was okay, you know, and she can live uh, to, you know, to tell about the story. Um, so how do we educate the motoring public about school bus stop arm safety? Um, we often hear about school bus stop arm edu uh, education, but really the only times I ever hear about it would be two different times. One is usually at the start of the school year. There's always talk about the school bus stop arm as school starts, and when there's an incident or accident, like there was with Indiana. Uh, the coverage in the aftermath was great, but it only lasted about a week. And then it's back to, uh, you know, normal. So this is the reality. Violations are occurring every day and putting our most precious cargo at risk. Uh, we need to do whatever we can to help minimize that risk. Uh, continued ed education on the school bus, stop arm safety will go a long way to help um, reduce the risk and keep our precious cargo safe. And on behalf of all transportation directors across the great state of Minnesota, I ask that you give 100% support to this bill. Thank you, Mr. White. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Senator Dreheim to come to the table. I do have two members who wanted to uh, either ask a question or make a comment. First is Senator Carlson, but members, please keep in mind uh, our 12 o'clock press conference. Senator Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I guess my question is uh, more directed toward the, uh, the testifiers who brought uh, brought up the uh, Stalky bus service, as well as uh, Mr. McMahon. Uh, and I, I wanted to know what... what Mr. McMahon, do you want to come to the testifying table? I'll ask the question while you're coming up, but what percent of school buses today do not have the cameras that we need? Uh, that's the first part of the question. And then uh, do we have a cost on what per bus or per system, because it sounds like the, the system can be uh, several layers of, uh, of adequacy to, to identify the people and to actually keep records of the people that are doing the violations. Mr. McMahon. Uh, Mr. Please. Chair, uh, Senator, I don't have a precise number on what percent of buses have the camera versus don't, <clears throat> although I can say not many have the camera. Um, you know, uh, Scott Kennedy's testimony, you know, he's put the cameras on the buses that are frequently having problems, but he you know, can't put them on all of the buses. Uh, from the camera standpoint, you know, it's probably three to five hundred dollars for the camera and the mounting of it. Um, it generally then ties into the video system that uh, that exists within the bus that they're filming inside the bus. Um, if the bus doesn't have that system, you know, you're talking uh, several thousand dollars for that portion of it. But you know, per bus, you know, it's three hundred to five hundred dollars uh, to do it. Um, Lieutenant Rue can give you the precise number, but we have ballparkish 14,000 buses uh, in, in the network in the state. 
Senator Osmick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just, <clears throat> just briefly, um, what I've heard is that uh, for some enterprising, perhaps, legislator that might be a lawyer, um, seems to me mandatory minimum sentencing for some of these offenses would be in line. Uh, if you added it to this bill, unfortunately, that sends you through the Judiciary Committee. So um, do that at your own risk. Um, but I think there should be a mandatory minimum on this. Plea bargaining this down is ridiculous. Um, that being said, we do have, we did pass off the Senate floor, for those of you who are here, a very tough distracted driving penalties bill that isn't getting any action or any progress in the House. I'm sorry, the other body. Um, this would put distracted driving, which seems to me this is part of the problem uh, that you're having, uh, on par with drunk driving. Uh, it's a penalty situation. It doesn't prevent anything, but it does get the attention of people who are being distracted and particularly with cell phone use um, causing these situations. So just those two comments, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Osmick. Senator Dreheim, um, you have uh, Senate file 1050. It's my understanding you have an author's amendment. Is that correct? Thank you, Chair. Yes, I do. I would entertain a motion. Uh, have we got the author's amendment out? It's in your packets. What? The A1 amendment, I'd entertain a motion to move. So moved. Senator Yuzinski has moved the A1 amendment. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The motion passes. The amendment is adopted. Uh, Senator Dreheim, to your bill as amended. Thank you, Chair. And uh, all the amendment does is push out the, uh, the year to this later this summer uh, because of the fiscal year ending. Um, you know, pretty pretty straightforward bill. You know, first I, I would like to thank all the uh, operators and drivers that came today. Um, I'd, I'd also like to thank uh, Schmidt and Sons for bringing a bus today. Um, you know, it, I have kids that are still driving the school bus, and uh, it's close to home. This isn't the first school bus safety bill that I've tried to work on since I've been up here. I appreciate it, Chair, for you taking time to. Uh, to talk about this important issue, um, you know, to me, it's it's about transparency and education with almost every bill I do, and uh, what we're trying to do here is bring more awareness. And uh, you know, it's not a budget year. I realize that. Um, I, I kind of view um, the dollar amount as a placeholder, uh, hopefully to get some funds to uh, help educate the public. Um, I think we all know better. Um, I think we just need to be in front of people more often on, on the risks. These videos are, are fantastic. Um, I, I think they're probably the best tools we could use on why it's important to pay attention and not be distracted when we're driving. Um, so that's, that's it in a nutshell, Chair. Thank you, Senator Dreheim. Uh, member questions, Senator Yuzinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, I was going to wait a little bit, but I just wanted to uh, make one announcement before we leave today that uh, tomorrow is uh, School Bus Driver Appreciation Day. Uh, so all you guys do, what you do every single day, we really appreciate it. I just want to get on record before we had to leave. And I wanted to say it during my bill, but I forgot, so I wanted to get it on record. But again, we appreciate everything you do every day. Uh, we can obviously see the emotion that's behind you guys, and we do appreciate that. I was a school bus rider myself. My kids were a school bus rider, as Senator Dreheim's are, and we can't say enough for what you do for our kids and, and helping them with their safe travels to school and back every single day of the school year. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, any other questions? Senator Klein. Chair, uh, I wonder if there's an opportunity or if you think it's prudent to have these videos made available to members on the committee. Uh, they seem pretty compelling, and if we can um, amplify them through our own social media accounts, it may be effective. So. Mr. McMahon, uh, uh, there you are. Uh, would that be possible? Uh, Senator, uh, we can, we can figure, out, figure out how to make things work. Um, the couple, the last two that you saw I, are both available. If you Google YouTube, uh, you can track them down very easily from news clips and such. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind, uh, Mr. McMahon, provide us with the links or the ability uh, to obtain those. Uh, I think that Senator Klein's request is uh, uh, very appropriate. 
Any other questions by any members? Uh, Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you for having this uh, focus, this committee hearing focus on this subject. It's important. Thank you, Mr. McMahon, for, for uh, pulling this together and, and uh, helping us. I'm, I'm motivated and inspired, too. I, have a, this, uh, I just wanted to put a pin in another subject um, for a future conversation, and I'll take it up with Colonel Langer. Um, I've noticed myself in my own driving that uh, people don't seem to pull over for emergency vehicles anymore um, in any appreciable way. I think people forgot that they have to do that. So I want to look into that and maybe bring that up for discussion in the not too distant future. Particularly if folks are going in the opposite direction, they don't think they have to pull over. If they're going in the same direction, they think they can just pull over to the right and roll along slowly, and that's just not how it's supposed to be. And I think people have just forgotten that practice as well. Well, Senator Dibble, that's a good point. We, uh, uh, we can take that up with Colonel Langer and, uh, and, and handle it as appropriate, but thank you for that suggestion. Uh, Senator Senjum, did you have a question? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just, just a comment. Uh, I think we're all moving today. Uh, I, I just want to appreciate, uh, echo uh, other comments and express my appreciation for bringing this forward. Uh, I don't think I have ever had the appreciation I should have had for the, the scope of this problem. Uh, yeah, we see a video once in a while and it's awful, but to hear the, the frequency that uh, this kind of thing is occurring uh, tells me that uh, we got we got you know, and thank you, Senator Graham, for this education program. We, we've got some work to do here. Uh, we, we could do better than this. I, I'm just struck by, again, the frequency and, of course, the severity of this, but uh, whatever it might be that we need to do to enhance our public knowledge about this problem and, and, and get better compliance, uh, we need to do that, whether it's stronger penalties or whatever it might be. This is serious stuff. Thank you, Senator Senjum. Senator Franson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and just want to say thank you for bringing the story of Edina Public Schools, which is one of the districts that I represent. And I remember when I um, uh, reached out to the superintendent, I was dreading to hear the answer back, and I'm just so grateful that she was fine. And thank for you sure. for sharing that story, and um, for all of you for being here, for advocating for this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Franson. Senator Carlson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I, I too want to uh, just briefly say that uh, thank you for bringing this up. Um, the years that we've spent on the distracted driving issue, uh, it, it has brought something to mind that uh, sometimes we just can't figure this out unless we see what the problem is. Like uh, Senator uh, Klein said, is the best thing is to see the examples. We just sometimes don't have the vision to be able to see what happens when someone disobeys the law or puts kids in danger, like that uh, truck going through on the right-hand side there that makes your breath uh, just suck in, as, and uh, also the other child walking across the street. Uh, and those are the kinds of things that I think we need, to, we need to make public. We need to make it so that people can see it, and then they start to realize the danger that their own children are in. And I appreciate it if you can make those available to us, and, and you know, I promise that I'm going to be uh, publicizing them. So thank you very much. Members, that brings us to the, uh, the end of the, uh, the uh, presentation, and, and uh, I don't see any further questions on Senator Dreheim's bill. Um, I would entertain a motion that Senate File 1050, as amended, uh, be recommended to pass and re-referred to finance. Mr. Chair, I would happily make that motion. Senator Yuzinski has made the motion. Uh, all those in favor of the motion, uh, uh, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The motion uh, is adopted. Uh, I want to I thank everybody for coming in today. Uh, like Senator Senjum, uh, I will honestly say I did not appreciate uh, the severity of, of what's going on out there. The, the videos are just, they're just stunning. Uh, and, and so, Mr. McMahon, thank you for bringing those in. And please do what Senator Klein has requested uh, so that 
we have the ability to disseminate some of this information, but I was really surprised, uh, I, I have to say. Uh, so I would, uh, I just want to thank you all for coming in. This is really, uh, as uh, Senator Dibble indicated, a really important topic. Uh, there is a press conference at noon on the front steps of the Capitol, and uh, I would encourage all of you to attend that press conference. Uh, we have done our best to get the media uh, interested in the topic, and uh, and hopefully they will uh, go forward with some news stories that are beneficial to us. Uh, so again, thank you very much, and with that, we are adjourned.